Good evening. Uh, my name is Ralph Cicerone from the National Academy of Sciences, and welcome to the 16th annual lecture named after Dr. Arthur M. Sackler. Uh, in your brochures, there's a brief but, but very telling biographical sketch of Dr. Sackler. It's quite impressive. I hope you'll take a chance, take the time to read it either now or, or later be <coughs> because it's, uh, it's really quite stunning. We also want to thank Dame Jillian Sackler, who's here tonight, for sponsoring this series. Jill. <laughs> Today, all day, and tomorrow, there is the continuation of the Arthur M. Sackler Colloquium on the title that's being flashed up here on the screen, which, of course, is connected with Dr. Lubchenko's talk this evening, which we look forward to it. Before I go any further, I should tell you, we've been told that there's some kind of a large problem with the metro system tonight, and any number of people have called us and told us that they're stuck on the metro, but we're going to go ahead and hope that they'll be able to find their way in, and please tolerate them, because it, it seems that it wasn't their fault. <coughs> Let me recognize the organizers of the colloquium that started today, this morning and almost all of them are here this evening. Uh, <clears throat> Alison Galvani, Yale University. Uh, Simon Levin from Princeton, and Bert Singer from University of Florida. Madhur Anand from University of Guelph. Uh, Chris Balch from University of Waterloo. And yes, and also Lord Robert May. Bob from Oxford couldn't be here tonight, but he also contributed to the organization. So thanks to all of you. Let me now introduce our friend and colleague and great scientist and communicator, Dr. L uh, Jane Lubchenko. She's a marine ecologist and environmental scientist with expertise in oceans, fisheries, uh, biodiversity, climate change, and interactions between the environment and human well-being. She received a bachelor's degree from Colorado College, a master's from University of Washington, and a PhD from Harvard. She's been a pioneer, and remains so, actually, in informing the public about science, and she founded the Aldo Leopold Leadership Program, which is making quite a splash in those circles. That program is aimed at enhancing the ability of research scientists to communicate their findings to more general audiences. She helped to create the Communications Partnership for Science and C, the C, it's called COMPASS. It's an organization devoted to educating policymakers on ocean marine ecology. She was one of the primary organizers of the organization called Climate Central, which focuses on disseminating information on climate change to the public. <clears throat> she was, uh, the immediate past administrator of the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and Under Secretary of Commerce. She was, of course, the first woman to ever hold that position, amongst other things. But as NOAA administrator, she was also deeply involved with the response to the Deepwater Horizon explosion and oil spill disaster. And she developed new policies related to coastline management, fisheries, and the next generation of weather satellites while as NOAA administrator. She supported efforts to improve climate forecasting, and she oversaw this creation of what's called Weather Ready Nation, which is an initiative designed to deal with extreme weather. Since leaving NOAA, she's returned to teaching and research at Oregon State University, and she also serves as the first United States envoy for the Department of State for the ocean. We look forward to hearing Dr. Lubchenko's speech tonight, her talk. Uh, I already heard a comment that people are looking forward to hearing the optimistic side of it. Uh, we all are. <laughs> Jane is also an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences. Jane? Thanks, Ralph. Thank you very much. Okay, will do. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. 
Ralph, thank you for that very gracious introduction. Uh, and Dame Jill Sackler, thank you so much for being here tonight, but also for the opportunity to have this wonderful series of Sackler colloquia as well as the lecture. Uh, thanks for making time, everybody, for being here. Uh, as you can see, my title is intended to be uh, on the hopeful side. Um, but I think that there's one thing that's worse than just blind hope and optimism. Uh, and that is false hope and optimism. And so what I'd like to do tonight is paint a series of stories for you about uh, some of the very real and unprecedented challenges in the ocean today uh, and not undermine the immensity of tackling those challenges, but at the same time coupling that with some good news about many of the uh, amazing success stories that are bubbling up all around the world, uh, trying to address some of these challenges. We are far from being at a point where those are the norm and those are uh, what we uh, are taking for granted, but they at least give me hope that we can, in fact, replicate and scale up those successes and have uh, a real different outcome from the current trajectory that we are on. So I'm going to start with some threats. I'm going to talk about some of the new science that has triggered new awareness of the ocean, new awareness of possible new solutions, uh, and more importantly, new action that is resulting uh, in some pretty transformative changes, really getting at some of the root problems uh, that are causing the threats. I'm gonna dig down a little bit more deeply and focus on some specific uh, success stories and then focus more on uh, the path forward. So that's sort of the overall arc of, uh, of tonight's remarks. I wanna start with how people have traditionally thought about the ocean. Uh, the concept that the ocean is infinitely bountiful and infinitely resilient has been part and parcel of the human mindset toward the ocean. And it continues to be reflected in many of our policies and practices regarding the ocean. Uh, I think uh, we can certainly add a question mark uh, behind that today because we have seen in the last few decades, five, six decades in particular, how very real, uh, the, how, how the reality that we have in fact uh, have um, significantly depleted the ocean and disrupted the functioning of ocean ecosystems and that that depletion, depletion and disruption are having very real ramifications to our economic systems, our social systems, and to uh, the other critters in the ocean uh, along with the species that we are removing. So the question is, can we recover the bounty in the ocean? What would that take? What would it look like? Oceans provide a wealth of benefits to people. They are by and large things that we have taken for granted. They've always been there. Uh, they include very obvious things like food, seafood, and when people think about food security these days, they tend to focus on grain and livestock. But in fact, they need to be thinking fish as well. Seafood is a very critical component of food security. Oceans provide more than that, though. Oxygen, medicines, fuel, they play a key role in climate regulation. In regulating pests and pathogens, we're having lots of new outbreaks of harmful algal blooms, uh, of uh, diseases uh, taking over coral reefs, uh, blooms of jellies that are actual pests uh, for many ecosystems. So there's something out of whack in many of these systems and we're seeing more of those. Coastal ecosystems also provide protection against storm erosion and the power of tsunamis, uh, in particular mangroves uh, or coral reefs, kelp forests, are important barriers to coastal erosion. They also provide very important cultural 
and spiritual and recreational services. So these are all the kinds of things uh, that, that, th that oceans do for us. Many of those are being compromised simply because uh, we have overfished, we're losing habitats, destroying them, actively converting them, especially along coastal margins, but not exclusively. Pollution, chemical, nutrient, plastic pollution is taking its toll, and all of those are depleting and disrupting ocean ecosystems, and that in turn is affecting not only those systems, but the delivery of those benefits that we rely on from the ocean. If that weren't bad enough, we add climate change and ocean acidification on top of those other stressors, those other threats. And make no mistake, there are very real challenges ahead associated with not just each of those stressors individually, but the collective total is a, a daunting um, challenge to us. Hence the doom and gloom. There's very real reason to be concerned about what lies ahead because of all of these threats. On the other hand, there, I believe, uh, because of those threats, that has motivated many people to take a look at what some of the other alternatives might be. So the grand challenge that we're faced with uh, is how to meet the current needs of people while also restoring ecosystems that have been disrupted, depleted, not only in the ocean, but on land, such that we can meet the needs of people tomorrow. And to put a finer point on that relative to the ocean, the question is, can we use the ocean without using it up? To echo Carl Safina's language, I think that's a nice encapsulation of the challenge that lies ahead. If we understand that the ocean and people represent a coupled human natural system, actually a series of coupled human natural systems, they are interconnected, uh, then that uh, helps us understand what's happening, what the possibilities are, what the trade-offs are. And there has been a rich array of knowledge emerging from scientific analyses about the coupling, about different systems, how one kind of change triggers another kind of change, uh, and especially around these ideas of complex adaptive systems, which is what these are. So you see in this picture here uh, a, a nice coral reef uh, that is providing food for people, but we also, this social benefit is also linked to the economic benefit. This is the Rabobank uh, map of fishery trade flows, and as you can see, it is absolutely global. So these are complex systems, different people have been studying different elements of them. That knowledge is beginning to uh, shed new um, insight as to not only what's happening, but what the drivers of change might be, where the leverage points, where, the, where we can change incentives uh, and modify outcomes to have uh, a, a different outcome. So, in short, a wealth of scientific advances is now triggering a new era of awareness and a new era of action. Many academic scientists have been involved in this knowledge creation and now in this transfer of knowledge to action. And they have done so through working with industry, with government, with stakeholders like fishermen, uh, and with not-for-profit organizations to co-create knowledge, to co-create tools, and then to help implement some of the changes that have been developed and put them into practice uh, through changes in policies uh, or management practices. So scientists are doing things very differently in the ocean space than they were a couple of decades ago, really rolling up their sleeves and getting much more involved in creating not just identifying problems, but helping to create solutions. 
Uh, natural and social scientists have been collaborating a lot more, uh, both with each other and with these other entities that are key to really affecting meaningful change. So we're understanding nature, society, and the economy as much more integrated, coupled, uh, and uh, amazingly enough, uh, this knowledge uh, is now being recognized at some of the highest levels on the international stage uh, with 193 countries agreeing uh, last September for the first time ever to integrate environmental, social, and economic agendas through the Sustainable Development Goals and to work toward a decarbonized future with the Paris Climate Agreement, and also to begin work on a high seas treaty. Now, these are aspirational. The countries of the world are saying, we hear there's a problem, we understand we need to be integrating these different things, this is the direction we want to go. That's a far, far cry from actually having on the ground changes. So this is hopeful, but it's not enough. This is hopeful because there is increased recognition. What we really need is for this to translate into successes in each of those arenas, and the question is how might that happen? One of the 17 sustainable development goals that the United Nations has just adopted that will frame the international agenda for the next 15 years is this number 14, the ocean. Uh, and so this is a, a, a new thing for the ocean to be much more upfront and on stage in the global arena of these coupled social, economic, and environmental integrated framework uh, that are the sustainable development goals. So I've talked just briefly about the threats and some of the new awareness and the actions by government, but I really want to focus your attention on recent successes in a couple of different arenas that are related directly to implementation of those aspirations. I'm gonna start with fisheries, and I'll spend most of my time on fisheries. I'll touch on marine reserves, a special type of marine protected area that are fully protected from any extractive activities, and then talk about some integrated solutions and the way forward. You'll note that I'm not touching on every single possible problem in the ocean, uh, but we don't have all day. So I'm gonna focus in on a couple of those. So let's start with fisheries. Uh, fisheries are, without a doubt, uh, one, of the important, one of the most important activities in the ocean. Uh, but in recent decades, they have also been one of the most destructive, not by any intention, but just because of the way we've gone about doing that. Fisheries mean a lot of different things. They mean different things to developed countries and developing countries. They are a way of life. They are a cultural identity. They mean business opportunities, job creation, healthy food. That's more uh, a Western, Northern view. They also mean food security, poverty alleviation, economic development, and gender equity. And uh, in my capacity as the U.S. Science Envoy for the Ocean, I've been working with a number of developing nations, many of whom are interested now in the blue economy. That's sort of the new bandwagon. There's been a lot of depletion on land, and so the focus is, okay, let's move to the ocean as a way of uh, having job creation, economic <coughs> development. Obviously, there are smart ways to do that, and there are destructive ways to do that. And so many of our conversations are, how do we think about those trade-offs? How do we have not just short-term job creation and short-term economic benefit for a few, but long-term job creation economic benefit for the many? How, what do those trade-offs look like? How do you do that? One in seven people rely on fish for their daily protein. So clearly, again, this is echoing my earlier comments about the importance of the ocean for food security. I'm gonna be focusing primarily on fisheries, but aquaculture is the other part of this story. And I wanna draw your attention to uh, this figure because it really illustrates um, 
Two uh, in magenta here is human population growth. This is starting in 1950. This is 2010. So population growth going like this. And the aqua co color here is uh, global fisheries catches. And you'll notice that for about four decades, uh, the two were increasing at about the same rate. Uh, in the 80s, global fisheries catches leveled off, and they have remained constant, if not decreasing slightly. They're at about uh, 80 million metric tons. Uh, these data are from 2010, but that's, it's not too much uh, off of that for the last few years since then. So one question is, um, how are we going to make up this difference, given that there are more and more mouths to feed and that uh, food from the sea uh, is likely part of that solution? Clearly, aquaculture is going to play a very critically important role, but only if it's sustainable aquaculture. Uh, but setting aquaculture aside for a moment, I really want to focus on the fisheries story and just simply pose the question, why has this leveled off? Uh, is there something that can be done about that? Not to suggest there aren't very real limits at some point, but are we truly at the limit now? What are the opportunities might exist? So let's just ask the question, what is limiting the supply of wild-caught seafood? First of all, we've run out of new places in the ocean to fish. And I'll show you an animation of that in a minute. Secondly, we have seriously unsustainable practices and policies in many parts of the world. We also have a lot of illegal fishing, unregulated and unreported fishing, commonly called IUU fishing. This is a new jargon term for some of you. Uh, and finally, uh, we don't really have any refuges to hedge our bets against accidental mismanagement or some kind of environmental changes. So those are the five areas I want to treat. Uh, and let's start off with the first one, no more new places to fish. So I'm going to show you an animation that was prepared by scientists at the University of British Columbia for, uh, in the Sea Around Us project for the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And uh, what they did was to take data from the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, and uh, starting in 1951, uh, they year by year plotted where the peak fishing activity was. And then when an area was depleted, the fishing industry would move on to another area and then on and on. And so it'll show you in red, I mean in white is pre-peak, red is the harvest peak, and then pink, uh, or salmon I guess, it's more salmon-y, is the post peak. Some of that post peak is actually seriously depleted. Some of it can recover, so the pink doesn't really tell you what the status of the fishery is. Uh, so I'm going to start this animation. Uh, pay attention to the counter. It's going to go up to 1999. Uh, and pick any place. I'm going to start it now. Pick any place uh, along a coastline. And you will note that initially, the peak fishing activity was right along the coastal margins. And then it goes farther and farther away from the coasts and farther and farther into the southern hemisphere, such that by the year 1999, we fish virtually every place in the ocean. I'm going to let it run again, pick another part of the coastline, another part of the world, and you can see the same picture developing. This is a pretty graphic illustration uh, of the fact that there are no more new places to fish. We've pretty much exhausted those. We're also fishing deeper and deeper. Uh, so that it's not just the surface areas, but we're going deeper as well. Let's shift now to the second and the third, unsustainable fishing practices and policies. Uh, and this again are data from the Food and Agricultural Organization. And they show you the percent of fisheries stocks in different categories, developing, fully exploited, overexploited, collapsed, and down here, rebuilding, uh, starting in 1950. 
And it should be pretty obvious that in 1950, the story was very different from what it is today. Uh, all, over 80% of the fisheries were developing. And at that point in time, there were no fisheries that were overexploited or collapsed. Fast forward a couple of decades, that picture has changed dramatically. It has been what has ca been called serial overfishing, overfishing one stock, depleting it, moving on, finding a new one, either a new stock, a new place in the ocean. And so this picture has been the history of fishing uh, in the last decade. As in, especially post-World War II era, more technology was brought to bear, uh, enabling uh, us to get more fish faster uh, and new places that were previously inaccessible. The hopeful story here is, uh, sorry, that there is some rebuilding that is just beginning down here. Uh, and so that's the story that we're going to pick up on. So the question here is really, uh, the, the story has been fishing harder and harder with fewer and fewer returns. And this has been especially problematic for many small-scale fisheries in developing countries. And the question is, is the situation hopeless? Uh, is there nothing that can be done? Just fishing harder and harder, that doesn't seem to be uh, being very successful. I would suggest to you that no, it is not hopeless. In fact, the tide is turning. There are changes that are underway to modify those practices and policies, modify the way we are fishing with the concept of not just fishing harder and harder, but being smarter about how we are fishing, doing it in a way that is less destructive, doing it in a way that doesn't deplete populations. What does that look like? Well, we need uh, to understand that there are two general types of fishery management. One is what is typically been done many places in the world, which is called common pool management. It's also called the race to fish. All the fishermen in a fishery are competing against one another, either all the time or when the season starts, the gun goes off. They race out, get as m many fish as fast as they can, fish as hard as they can before the quota is reached, if there is a, a quota for a particular fishery. That's very different from uh, an alternate type of fishery management uh, called rights-based management. There are different models for rights-based management. One of them uh, are called catch shares or individual transferable quotas uh, or fishing concessions. And in that model, a dedicated share of the scientifically determined catch is divided up among the fishers. They each have their allocated quota, and they are free to fish when they want, uh, as long as they stop when they have caught their quota. This changes the incentive systems for fishermen because they have a guaranteed fraction of the pie, let's say 5%. Uh, and so it's now, and that 5% is good whether the pie is small or whether it is really, really large. And so there's an incentive to conserve, incentive to think long term, to have the fishery be healthy and grow so that your 5% uh, actually translates to many more pounds of fish. There's another type of rights-based management that is allocates places to fish, not total, not uh, a fraction of the quota. Scientific analyses has, have really transformed the way uh, fishery managers are thinking about fisheries and how it is being practiced and, and, and the way uh, fishermen are thinking about it. And I want to walk you through this figure because it really has had uh, an incredible impact uh, on uh, fishery management. Um, the use of rights-based fisheries uh, didn't really take off until the mid-80s, and that's what this blue line is. This is the percent of a particular type, uh, the most common type of rights-based fishery, the ITQ. So they really became much more common uh, in um, the mid-80s and have continued on. This analysis by Chris Costello, Steve Gaines, and John Lynham really uh, looked at what has been the history of fisheries with and without 
these rights-based management. So this, they analyzed fisheries that did not have uh, any kind of ITQ fishery. That's this red line. And as you can see, this is the percent of fisheries that has collapsed. So in 50, there were none that were, had collapsed. But through time, more and more of the fisheries have collapsed without any kind of rights-based management. In contrast, uh, those fisheries, and this was around 11,000 fisheries all around the world, those fisheries that had a rights-based system, uh, until before the uh, rights-based program was implemented, they were on the same trajectory. Once they adopted a rights-based system, then that trajectory deviated quite considerably from the trajectory of the other rights-based programs. So this evidence and analysis of fisheries around the world, uh, large scale, small scale, uh, northern, southern, uh, really was a wake-up call uh, and said to many, maybe there are alternate approaches to fishery management that should be considered. Uh, the United States uh, has, uh, is a very important fishing nation, uh, and in 2006, there were very significant reforms to the fishery policies in the United States. This is under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, uh, and these were amendments that were passed in 2006. And there were two main features of the changes that have been transformative. One is an absolute mandate to end overfishing. The United States says that fisheries in federal waters, that overfishing must end. And it's not just aspirational. It has to end with a particular timetable. And if you overfish one year, you have to underfish another year. So there are real teeth to this. Uh, policy, uh, and it is science-based. You have to make set quotas for every single federally managed fishery, and it has to be based only on uh, scientific information. So that was um, a major reform uh, to our U.S. fishery policy. The other major change was that rights-based approaches can also uh, be uh, used again. They, they had been used somewhat earlier. There was a moratorium on them. They can be used again. This gives fishermen a voice and a stake in the future uh, with aligning short-term and long-term incentives. Those changes have been extraordinarily difficult to accomplish. They were to implement. They were really, really hard. Uh, it's been uh, painful for managers, for fishermen, for pretty much everybody involved, but it has resulted in some amazing changes. I'm going to show you some data from U.S. federally managed fisheries, and I'm going to compare two years, just the year 2000 to the year 2015. In the year 2000, there were 92 federally managed stocks that were overfished. That's a lot. That's not good. After the implementation of these rules, by 2015, that had been cut to a third. That is impressive progress. That's really, really amazing. Moreover, and even better, in the year 2000, there were zero stocks of fish that had been depleted and then rebuilt to the point that they could be fished again. But by the year 2015, there are now 39 stocks that have been rebuilt and are now being fished sustainably. So that's a pretty good news story. Uh, and the piece of that story that is connected to these rights-based uh, catch share programs, uh, this gives you the data on the number of rights-based plans that were in place in 2005 with the number of species, the number of unique stocks, 24, and now there are 16 plans and 170, 107 unique stocks under rights-based plans in the U.S. So there has been a major overhaul of U.S. fisheries and federal waters that is a very significant uh, success story for not only the U.S., but has gotten the attention of many uh, in other nations uh, around uh, the world. I'm going to give you two quick examples, one from the West Coast, the West Coast groundfish ITQ fishery. 
Uh, Washington, Oregon, California had been a very vibrant fishery for decades, but it was seriously overfished, so much so that in the year 2000 it was declared a federal fishery disaster. Uh, a new rights-based management program uh, with the new Magnuson um, rules about uh, plans went into effect in 2011, and there has been an amazing comeback of this fishery as a result of both the mandate to end overfishing with teeth and timetables and the adoption of this IDQ plan. A reduction in the bycatch, the accidental catch of two-thirds, which had been a real problem in that fishery. So this is the environmental benefit of this, uh, these reforms. And previously, uh, very few of the species were deemed sustainable by independent third-party certifiers. Uh, the Marine Stewardship Council, MSC, now certifies 13 of those species as sustainable, and all 40 of the ground fish uh, species uh, are uh, rated highly by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. So pretty impressive uh, recovery. Another good news story uh, following this pattern is from the Gulf of Mexico, the red snapper fishery, the commercial red snapper fishery. Uh, which had been on the brink of collapse because of decades of overfishing. They adopted a rights-based plan in 2007, uh, and the result has been the stock has now tripled in size, uh, waste has dropped by half, uh, the catch limits have now doubled, fishermen can catch more than they could before, revenue is just going through the roof, uh, it's safer for the fishermen, uh, and it also has been certified as uh, sustainable. So a real good news story for both of those major fisheries. I would note that not all fisheries in the U.S. have seen a comparable comeback, if you will. Uh, you're all familiar with the New England Atlantic Cod uh, situation, and that is one where a combination of overfishing for decades and now probably climate change with warmer waters has really uh, been problematic and has not resulted uh, in a comeback in this particular uh, species. So climate change uh, is sort of the new kid on the block that's introducing new complications to fisheries. Other species in the Atlantic we know, in addition to cod, are moving northward. Uh, this is a picture we're seeing around the world where many important fishery species are moving toward the poles and to deeper waters uh, as uh, waters get warmer and warmer. Uh, in response, NOAA has uh, just recently issued a new strategy for dealing with climate change, uh, acknowledging that we need to fold climate change into our management of fisheries. So that's important, that's good news. Uh, but the fact that we have these very significant benefits from the new reforms that have been put in place have really gotten a lot of attention and in fact triggered other nations or groups of nations such as the U EU to follow in our footsteps. So the, United, uh, so the EU took a good hard look at what we had put in place and what it took and in 2013 finalized reforms to their common fishery policy that uh, are now uh, very similar to what we had done with a mandate to end overfishing and rights-based approaches being allowed. Uh, that policy is very important. Those reforms are terrific. Many thought it would never, ever happen, but it has. Uh, they still have to be implemented, and I think uh, there, it will be very important to watch and see. Rights-based fisheries uh, are uh, gaining currency around the world. Some nations were uh, experimenting with them before the U.S. did, uh, but now there are more than 500 species in over 40 countries that have some kind of rights-based fishery uh, program. Uh, I would note that uh, rights-based approaches are not a panacea. They're not going to solve all the problems that exist. Uh, they have to be well-designed. The, the, the key is in the design of them. Uh, and so a well-designed rights-based fishery program can, in fact, have some of the transformative results that uh, I have been describing. Uh, but they need to be appropriate for a fishery, and they have to be well-designed. 
So we've learned a lot about how to have more sustainable practices and policies, and that knowledge has now uh, been put to good use. Let's turn now to the illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. Uh, this is a serious problem around the world, really, really serious. The ocean is a big place. There are a lot of places for bad actors to be doing bad things. Uh, and in fact, the global losses are from 10 to 23 billion US dollars annually. So it's a big, big operation. For far too long, people thought, how can we deal with this problem? It's, it's just so immense, and there's, you can't patrol every place in the ocean. It's impossible. Well, that thinking has actually changed, and there are a number of new things that are underway that are really changing the game. Uh, there are new policies. Interpol now has an international fisheries crime unit, and they are actively uh, keeping track of vessels and companies that have been caught as uh, to do illegal fishing, for example, and uh, issuing uh, citations for them. Uh, so there's now a new legal regime for that. Uh, President Obama, Secretary John Kerry have been really uh, focused on uh, making improvements in oceans, not just the ones I described earlier with uh, um, legal fishing, but on the illegal fishing front. And at the Our Ocean Conference, the Secretary Kerry organized uh, initially uh, in here in Washington, D.C., <clears throat> that has now uh, sort of become the place for foreign ministers and countries around the world to make commitments and promises and announcements uh, about the ocean. Uh, there's been a spotlight shown on IUU fishing, uh, and Secretary Kerry has really been uh, in a key leadership role on that. The president set up a new task force on uh, IUU fishing, and that is beginning to make a difference. Uh, other countries, uh, EU has taken uh, IUU fishing very seriously. Uh, other countries have as well. And there's an international agreement called the Port State Measures Agreement that was, uh, that, that really um, is an agreement among nations who uh, have signed it, who have ratified it, uh, to do the following. Everybody acknowledges the ocean is a big place. It's hard to have uh, patrolling every place. But all those illegal fishing vessels have to come back to port. And so that's the place to get them. And so all the countries who uh, sign this and, and ratify it once it comes into effect are saying, we will not allow illegal vessels, vessels that have been caught as illegal fishing, to come into our ports. And so it's sort of like a spider in a spider's web waiting for uh, the bad actors to come and then pouncing. So 20 countries have now uh, ratified the Port State Measures Agreement. Five more are needed for it to come into effect. And that's been happening. The State Department has been taking a very uh, keen lead on this. And in fact, the whole discussion of fisheries and ocean issues has been elevated in this administration such that it's on the radar screen of the secretary, of the president, and in their discussions with other nations. Combating IUU is also happening uh, on another front. There's been a really interesting marriage of new science, new technology, gaming software, uh, and citizen science to keep the eyes on the bad guys in the ocean to see what they're doing using satellites, to watch them, to you can tell from their movement patterns what they're doing, uh, and to analyze in, in near real time what's happening. Uh, and then some citizen science uh, eyes on these uh, maps identifying the actors. So these are incipient efforts. Uh, the virtual watch room and eyes on the sea uh, led by Pew Charitable Trusts and Catapult Applications, the Global Fishing Watch by Google Sky Truth and Oceana are two efforts uh, in parallel to one another that are beginning to uh, really transform the action. And then there are also new collaborations to uh, really uh, rein in illegal fishing. In the Southern Ocean, for example, which is one of the most problematic places, new partnerships among legal fishers, among NGOs, among governments and others has really resulted in a very significant 
this is the uh, level of fishing uh, that is illegal. So uh, it reached a peak in mid-90s, and the actions of this group uh, collectively have been really uh, making a difference. So there is new action on the IUU front. We have far from solving that problem, but there is reason to be hopeful that, in fact, uh, we're making some very significant headway. The final factor limiting the amount of seafood are these refuges. And I'm going to segue now into a focus on marine protected areas and marine reserves. But before I do, I want to just take stock of what we've covered so far and summarize this by saying there's increasing movement to fishing smarter, not harder, using holistic science, science-based limits, teeth and timetables and mandates, but empowering fishermen and communities through rights-based approaches and then international cooperation on IUU. And this is, in fact, really making a difference. So switching now to marine protected areas, this is another pathway to helping recover depleted fisheries, but it's important in and of its own right for protecting biodiversity and habitats and for providing that wealth of benefits above and beyond seafood that we need and want. Marine protected areas are a lot of different things. They can involve uh, just one activity that's restricted or a whole bunch of things that are restricted. It's a pretty loose term. Uh, so I'm going to focus more on a subset of MPAs, those that we call marine reserves. These marine reserves are fully protected from any extractive activity, uh, fishing, drilling, mining, dumping, uh, any extractive or destructive activities. There have been a number of scientific efforts to analyze the hundreds of marine reserves around the world, and they are telling a very powerful story, specifically that when you create a no-take area, things happen inside that. If it's uh, well enforced, uh, you have uh, things getting big and crowded inside that, and some of that bounty is spilling over to the adjacent areas. Uh, this figure shows <coughs> changes in different biological measures, uh, biomass, density, size, diversity, uh, significant increases uh, in each of these, uh, regardless of whether it's a small area, a large area, it's in the tropics, it's in temperate areas. Uh, this, these are consistent patterns across all of those. So stuff happens that's not surprising. It's not really surprising at all, but it's nice to have the data. Uh, and much of the ecological functioning, the ecological relationships between predators and prey, herbivores and plants are reestablished in these protected areas. One of the most important contributions or uh, outcomes, I should say, of a protected area is that fish or invertebrates, crabs or lobster, uh, are allowed to get really big because the big ones aren't being caught uh, by uh, the extractive activities. When they get big, that brings huge benefit in terms of reproductive output. And this shows you a comparison between a vermilion rockfish that is about 14 inches in length, uh, that individual produces 150,000 young. So each of these little icons are the young that this one produces, and each one of those icons is about 100,000 young. So 150,000 young this, one, this fish produces. If you let this 14-incher grow up to be 24 inches, this individual produces 1.7 million young. So letting those fish get even a little bit bigger brings much greater reproductive benefit. And there are very few ways to protect those, what the fishermen call boffs, big, old, fat, female fish, boffs. <laughs> those boffs are the key to the next generations. And in protected areas, those fish can get big, they can reproduce. Some of the bounty inside spills over to the adjacent areas, but the young, the larvae, or the eggs can be transported in ocean currents pretty far away from 
the reserve. So there are very significant benefits that accrue to creation of uh, a reserve. Moreover, as we have more and more of these big ones and there are more and more studies on them, we're finding that large reserves are proving to be more robust and more resilient to some kinds of environmental changes. When bleaching happens, less of it happens and they recover faster, for example. So we're seeing very significant benefit. There's compelling scientific evidence about reserves, what I've described and some other results. And that in fact has now triggered um, a flurry of activity to create some new protected areas. This is a figure that shows the changes in the percentage uh, of global MPA coverage is what this figure shows. So these are all protected areas. And as you can see, for decades and decades and decades, there was very little new creation, very little increase. And then in the last decade, there's been a very dramatic increase in the number of marine protected areas. Uh, marine protected areas uh, are now 3.7% of the surface area of the ocean. The fully protected ones uh, the marine reserves are now 1.9%. So in just one decade, we have gone from the fully protected areas, the marine reserves, being only 0.1% of the ocean to now 1.9% of the ocean. So really huge increase in just um, the last uh, decade. However, UN targets say we should have 10%, and that's any MPA. We're a far cry from that. Scientists say, depending on your goals, if you want just to protect biodiversity, you probably need on the order of 20%. If you really want fishery enhancement, you might need 50% of the ocean protected. So we are a long, long way from either of those. So it's a good news and a bad news story. The good news is, there are a whole bunch more of these. The bad news is we are a long way from where we need to be. 2015 was really a banner year in terms of creation of new areas. And I have to think that Secretary Kerry's Our Ocean Conference had something to do with this because at the first Our Ocean Conference, uh, President Obama announced that he was expanding the Pacific Remote uh, Marine National Monument, Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, uh, and that got of a lot of attention. Uh, some of the other heads of state who were at the conference said, we're going to do the same, and then the next year they announced they had, and others announced that they had. And so in 2015, we had a huge number of announcements. Uh, large marine reserves around the world. Palau has now set aside 83% of its exclusive economic zone as fully protected uh, marine reserves. Chile is in, has announced and is in the process of implementing almost 25% of its EEZ. Um, the US, by comparison, protects about 15% of its EEZ. UK is now 20, almost 22%. New England, I mean, New Zealand announced right before the Our Ocean Conference at the UN that they were protecting 15, and Seychelles 30%. So a number of nations are moving down this path. Now, these are the leaders, uh, and most nations, most coastal nations, have very little to none, obviously, to get the percentages that we saw. But there is progress. There is increased recognition of the importance of this. Seychelles, at the Paris COP, announced a very innovative new twist on this, uh, brokered by the Nature Conservancy. Seychelles announced that its quite considerable foreign debt was going to be relieved by the Club of Paris in exchange for Seychelles having a plan for its entire exclusive economic zone. What are we going to do where? So a marine spatial plan, number one. Number two, they have to set aside 30% of their EEZ as fully protected marine reserve and they have to use the funds that have been donated now for this purpose to create a climate adaptation fund to fund climate adaptation in the ocean as well as on land.
So this got a lot of attention, especially from other small island states who said, hey, I've got debt too, you know, can, I, can I get in on the game? So this is a new debt for nature approach, a new way of bringing some international finance to the table. Remains to be seen how well this is gonna be implemented. A lot of people are watching it. Uh, it's a new model and it's actually very interesting and very exciting. So the successes that we have seen to date have really, I think, can be attributed to strong science about marine reserves, not just science that's been published in peer-reviewed journals, but science that was intentionally translated into lay language with easy to understand graphics, uh, and then shared with stakeholders, shared with fishermen, shared with policymakers, shared with NGOs. New partnerships between academic scientists and conservation groups, increased funding for both the science and the translation and the action. There's been a lot of uh, new dollars around this from philanthropies. And very courageous leadership on the part of some governments. So this is sort of a new era, and I think it, uh, even though it is far from where it needs to be, uh, good things are happening. So we have a conundrum. I've told you about all the great benefits that marine reserves can provide. Uh, if that's the case, how come we only have less than 2%? So what gives? Well, it's actually, I think, pretty straightforward. One, there's little public awareness of the need or the opportunities or the benefits. You know, the ocean for many people is still out of sight, out of mind. Two, the extractive users, those who stand to lose something in the short term, generally vigorously oppose the creation of any marine reserves. So there is a very you know, knee-jerk, nope, don't want this, it's bad, uh, et cetera. And that has created for many governments um, an impossible situation. So that's, that I think is largely responsible. However, some of the fishery reforms that I was talking about are now creating some safe space to think differently about ocean uses. Specifically, those rights-based programs that are spatially explicit, so um, the fishermen are given an exclusive rights to fish in a place, are now thinking differently about whether protecting uh, an area fully protecting it might have some benefit to them because they stand to reap directly uh, what the spillover and the export. Uh, in particular, so I'm gonna talk now about sort of the third more holistic approaches, com combining rights-based management that is spatially explicit with marine reserves, and these are called turf reserves. So this is applicable to all the small-scale fisheries around the world primarily. This is about 90% of the fishermen in the world. There are about 40 million fishers uh, in, that are in small-scale fisheries, and it's about a quarter of the global catch. And these are, uh, this rights-based, uh, spatially explicit uh, tool, TERF, stands for Territorial User Rights Fishery. And so a fisherman or a community uh, collaborative have exclusive rights to fish in an area. And in exchange for that, many of them are creating a marine reserve, a no-take area, inside of their fishing area. And then they, uh, uh, when the uh, fish begin to spill outside of that reserve, the fishermen, it's increasing their catches uh, in the area that they are fishing in. So in non-turf areas, where there are marine reserves elsewhere in the world, fishermen know exactly where the margins are. And you look at images from satellites about where the fishing activity is, it's right along the margins. Fishermen know that that's where the spillover is and, and that's where they are fishing. So this is exactly the same concept. And in this case, the fishermen are doing it either as part of the deal to do have a turf reserve or are just creating new reserves um, on their own. There's now a new program, Fish Forever, that is led by RARE the Environmental Defense Fund and UC Santa Barbara scientists. So here's another academic scientist, uh, NGO combination. Um, there are six new uh, programs 
uh, to establish turf reserves in these countries around the world, Belize, Brazil, Mozambique, Philippines, Indonesia, that's only five, isn't it? Sorry, five. Uh, and uh, some of them uh, have been going for long enough that they are bringing some very impressive uh, changes. Belize, for example, has shallow water fisheries. Uh, there was very significant overfishing, uh, a lot of illegal fishing, and uh, that, those were having very serious economic and social consequences to the people. Once they put in, uh, actually they did a couple of pilot programs in a couple areas along the Belize coastline. Uh, 2011, they, they started this uh, rights-based turf system and uh, a pilot with uh, reserves. And uh, it actually started, uh, the good things started happening pretty much immediately. The country said, whoa, this is so good, we want to replicate it, the entire coastline. So they've really scaled up and adopted this turf reserve concept for the entire coast uh, line of Brazil uh, that's supposed to be implemented this year. Um, the other one of these uh, Fish Forever programs that's pretty far along is in the Philippines. And again, there have been some uh, community efforts, not just with fishermen, but with full communities, to really uh, transform uh, and have some local pride in, uh, in this case, uh, shellfish, uh, the uh, clams that are harvested uh, as an iconic species, but to have sustainable fishing uh, and coupled with uh, a, a new marine reserve. So the conclusions from all of this, the small scale, the large scale, uh, all of it, is that it really is possible to end overfishing in both large and sm small scale fisheries. I showed you examples from uh, the US, from the West Coast ITQ groundfish fishery and the Gulf of Mexico red snapper commercial fishery. Uh, I showed you uh, some examples from Belize and from uh, the Philippines. Uh, and I think there are a number of lessons learned, things that cut across all of these. Science-based limits have been key. Rights-based approaches have really been transformative in those particular circumstances. And we've seen a combination of policies at the national level enabling bottom-up community-based efforts. And it's this combination of top-down coupled with bottom-up that seems to really uh, be very effective. So the challenge is, how can we replicate and scale up those uh, successes? What are the incentives for this to be replicated more broadly? There's new research uh, that's been led by Chris Costello, Steve Gaines, uh, 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 some others at UC Santa Barbara, and uh, scientists at uh, the Environmental Defense Fund. It's now in press in PNAS, and they call it the upside model. And what they did was to simply pose a number of questions. Could all of the fisheries in the world that are currently depleted be recovered, number one? Number two, if that were possible, how long would it take? How much would it cost? And what would be the outcome? How much more fish could be caught? How much more fish could remain in ocean ecosystems to play a critical role that they play? And what would be the profit that would result? So why the heck should we reform fisheries is pretty much what they're asking. Um, they analyzed about 5,000 fisheries, which represents about 80% 80, 80 of the global catch. And what they found was that, in fact, uh, Things can happen a lot faster than many people assume. They looked at the biology of each of the different species, calculated you know, how, how long it takes to reproduce, what the reproductive potential is. A uh, median fishery would need uh, less than 10 years to rebuild. That's pretty impressive. Uh, and the, uh, it, yes, it costs something to do that, uh, but the benefits outweigh the cost 10 to 1. In particular, uh, Compared to a business as usual scenario, the impact of both fishery reforms and rights-based approaches, that was the best outcome, uh, result in 29% uh, more seafood being caught, over 200% increase in profits, and 118% more fish biomass left in the water. So pretty impressive triple bottom line 
if you stop overfishing, you put in good reforms that enable stocks to recover. So the message is that in fact, there's huge upside to doing things right, to fishing smarter, not harder. The take home, ecological limits are real. There still are gonna be limits out there. But in fact, we are not at them yet. If we had better fishery management in small scale and large scale fisheries, the triple bottom line uh, could be much more significant than it is today. So I think that is very positive good news. Uh, so we've talked about everything other than the path forward. I've sort of hinted at what that might be. There are a lot of other threats in the ocean that I have not touched on. Plastics, the uh, combination in the upper right-hand picture of uh, human trafficking and drug trafficking with IUU fishing, that makes that uh, if solving those problems pretty complicated. Uh, coral reef bleaching because of warmer waters. Uh, loss of habitats along the coastline, those are all really important issues. Getting aquaculture right, and here you see a, a cartoon uh, description of fish being uh, farmed along with mussels on ropes uh, and seaweed. Uh, it's really important to get aquaculture right. That's going to be a key part of the food security of the future. Um, I think there are a lot of questions that remain. Are these solutions scalable, the ones that I've talked about? What are the enabling conditions for that to happen? I've talked about incentives, and that actually is very powerful. Uh, the incentive to a government, the incentive to fishermen, but how do you actually get there? Can they work despite climate change and ocean acidification, which are gonna result in some very cha big challenges for a lot of those fisheries? How can we have institutions become more nimble in the face of these environmental changes and what science and monitoring are needed? So there's a wealth of uh, good work still to be done, good partnerships. Uh, but to return to where I began, I think that the message that I'm seeing from uh, the research and on the ground efforts is that in fact it is possible to recover some of the bounty that has been lost uh, and that we should do everything possible to make sure that that's happened. I think there are reasons to be hopeful. Uh, we're seeing a successful transfer of knowledge to action in part because of the questions scientists have been asking and their willingness to roll up their sleeves and get engaged with the work of actually getting it into action and co-developing the knowledge. Uh, and we're seeing good evidence of science-based policy reforms to end overfishing and rebuild depleted stocks, much broader adoption and better design of rights-based programs, serious attention to ending IUU. I've touched on creation of large marine reserves, combining innovative ways, rights-based programs with marine reserves, um, and then the upside with big incentives to make changes. So it's my hope that, in fact, we can recover the bounty and use it wisely. I think there are good reasons to believe that that is at least possible, and I hope I've given you some antidote to the doom and gloom that has pervades much of the environmental discussions and especially those in the ocean. I don't want in any way, shape, or form to minimize the challenges, but I think it's useful to know that there are good things that are happening because we can build on those and we can make even better things happen. Thank you very much. Thank you.